Although most people have doubts regarding doomsday theories, the majority of people do agree that the Earth is in big trouble. The growing population puts a strain on food, energy, and water. While growth in technology may have increased food production, it was not fast enough to catch up with population growth. While the increased demand on energy has already caused so much trouble, throughout history, too many people seeking too little resources has always been the drive for conflicts, disasters, and disease. We live in a world that is wonderful if you don't think too much. What do you do if you can't help but think too much? Maybe you end up asking your doctor for Prozac. But if you're like me, who always wants to do the impossible, maybe we can try to change the world together. I mean, at least give it a try. But the growth in technology did help solve some food shortage problems. Or I should say, delay the consequences of such problems. By using pesticides, we increased food production dramatically. By using genetically modified crops, we not only increased production, but also cut cost. Have you ever thought about how many chemicals were injected into the food you eat? Or how much energy you burn when you set your thermostat to 70 degrees? Do you know, things we take for granted usually carry a cost. A cost either we have to pay for, or our children have to pay. I know there is not much one person can do, but if no one tries, we would still be living in the Stone Age. A long time ago, I was very disturbed when I read an article in the newspaper. Thanks to Google search, I found it, and would like to share it with you. In 2002, Zimbabwe and Tanzania, despite people dying from an ongoing famine, rejected thousands of tons of desperately needed foods from the USA. They basically are saying it is better a million people starve to death than eat perfectly nutritious, genetically modified food from the US. And you probably did not know that in the United States, up to 70% of prepared foods contain genetically modified ingredients. So, basically, we are eating what people dying of starvation refuse to eat when it is free. Although it was not big news, and totally not my business, I remember I was so upset that many would die because someone made such a foolish decision without asking them first. Now. You can cast stones at me because I am just like the farmers feeding chickens with antibiotics or raising cows with hormones, right? But there is a big difference. I only support these dramatic measures when there is no other choice. Accepting genetically modified crops may not be a smart choice, but to many countries, that may be the only choice. A lack of other alternatives has become the best excuse every time when there is a problem, even on energy. For many years, many countries considered nuclear power plants as the only solution to solving their energy crisis. But is nuclear a solution or a delusion? What would you say if I tell you that the choice to go nuclear for many countries has nothing to do with energy needs? For example, do you think Iran needs to develop a nuclear power plant? And don't forget, Iran has only 80 million people, but holds the world's fourth largest oil reserves. Do you remember what happened to Japan's Fukushima nuclear plant after the 2011 9.2 earthquake? Prior to the 3.11.11 earthquake, 30% of Japan's energy was via nuclear energy. Do you think it was by choice or need? At that time, 70% of the Japanese supported nuclear power before the earthquake. After the quake, the support dropped to 36%, and the government quickly shut down almost all of the nuclear plants. In 2012, 
Nuclear energy accounted for only 1% of Japan's energy consumption. In 2015, that dropped to zero. When Japan's last operating reactor in Hokkaido was shut down. Can you imagine a country like Japan losing 30% of its energy in such a short time? This must have been devastating to their economy, right? Not really. Take a look at their GDP from 2006 to 2015. For a country that just suffered a tremendous loss in the 2011 tsunami, they actually look pretty good to me. But to make up the loss of nuclear energy, Japan had to import 80% of its fuel. And the average household has paid higher prices. Electricity prices increased 19% between 2011 and 2015. And carbon dioxide emissions spiked. Compared with possible deaths by nuclear meltdown, I will say it's a small price to pay. You may wonder why Japan did not seek a cleaner, safer energy to replace its nuclear power, like hydro or solar. Well, unless you prepare years in advance, you can't expect to just turn the switch on and get clean energy. So, to continue this research, I want to try to find a country with growing energy needs, has the technology and experience with different energy sources, and offers open access to information and travel. For example, North Korea may be a great place to start, but I doubt if I can do much from a 4x4 cell. So, I decided to focus my research in Taiwan, an island where 23.5 million people live in only 35,980 square kilometers. But with a 1.1 trillion GDP in 2015, it's a free country where people can freely vote, strike, and protest. It has subtropical weather with average rainfall of 82.7 inches and a rigid topography that would guarantee a clean hydroenergy supply. And since 69% of the island is non-inhabitable mountains, the population density is really high. So they must need clean and safe energy. It already has three nuclear power plants, but just when Japan and Germany rushed to shut down their nuclear plants, Taiwan is preparing for the opening of a fourth one. And unbeknownst to most, Taiwan actually has a rich reserve of coal, 474 KTOE, kiloton of oil equivalent, which is three times Japan's coal reserve. Why will Taiwan seek nuclear power when it has so many other options? Let's take a look. Currently, there are three nuclear power plants in Taiwan, 30 thermal power generating units, two pump storage hydroelectric power plants, 46 renewable energy power plants, including the usual 41 hydroelectric power plants and wind power plants, five. However, more than 76% of Taiwan's power source dependency is thermal power, mostly coal, oil, gas, or other fossil fuels. So with this environmental unfriendly choice, Taiwan generates more than 170 million tons of greenhouse gas. To be specific, the thermal power sources are 37.6% coal-fired, oil 2.8%, gas 32.4%, and 3.2% cogeneration. Please note renewable energy like hydro only accounts for 4% plus hydro with an additional 1.4% from pumped storage hydro. No wonder Taiwan's average particulate pollution was 35 micrograms per cubic meter. That is the main reason for Taiwan wanting to build nuclear power plants, which currently are providing 18.6% of total power. You must be wondering why they have 46 hydro power plants that only generate 4% of the total energy. According to Dr. Wang, Taiwan has abundant water resources. 
Currently, Taiwan has about 100 reservoirs, but only 11 hydropower plants are still in operation. Most reservoirs have serious siltation problems and unable to produce the energy we need. However, there are ways to fix that problem. Before we talk about these solutions, let's talk about the problems. Currently, siltation has caused loss of storage and damages to the turbines of the hydropower plants. This has impacted rivers and neighborhoods downstream of the dam. Theoretically, you can create a sediment trapping system upstream from the dam, or sediment routing, sediment pass-through or bypass, or you can do sediment flushing, manage silt storage, or remove stored sediments. Each method has its pros and cons, and each reservoir, with the differences in size and location, require a different approach. As Taiwan is bound to be hit by several typhoons a year, reservoir siltation can be more of a problem than just loss of energy. But based on my study, if we fix the problems soon, our reservoirs can generate more than enough clean energy to solve the crisis we are facing. Do you know if we can bring Ming Tang Reservoir capacity back, it could generate more power than Nuclear Facility 1? That's one. Imagine what will happen if we can fix all of Taiwan's reservoirs. Hopefully, something can be done to these reservoirs so Taiwan can be self-sufficient for its energy needs with safe, clean hydroenergy. And with this short study, we can see how we can find solutions to seemingly impossible to solve problems. This is Ken Peters. Thank you for watching.